Alright, and uh, greetings everybody. Welcome uh, back. And if, if you've seen my other lectures, I'll say welcome back. And if you haven't seen any of my lectures, I will say uh, welcome to my uh, series on the 20th century, uh, themes of the 20th century. We um, are going to move into uh, the American Civil Rights Movement uh, today. And I just want to preface this lecture by saying how um, how much of a shift we have made in the field of education. I've noticed in the last 20 years that I've been teaching, uh, the last probably 10 years, we've really seen a sort of dramatic increase, not only in the teaching of social justice issues, but in, uh, students growing up with a much greater awareness of what social justice is. And certainly uh, when you look at things from the Canadian perspective, um, right now we are in a period where we are having a real sort of coming to in terms of understanding the impact of colonialism and the residential school phenomenon on First Nations people, uh, which is what we refer to Aboriginal people in Canada as, as First Nations. I believe in the States they still use the term Native Americans. Um, and sort of out of that, and you know, there's been a continued uh, understanding of whether it be, um, you know, gay rights, LGBTQ rights, and, and, and more and more of this kind of thing. And I think in many ways, in most ways, if not in all ways, it's been really, really very good for kids to have that kind of social awareness, to have that sensitivity, that discrimination really continues to be sort of... Um, marginalized, uh, although we do see its rearing its ugly head every now and again, and uh, which, which makes it even sort of more disturbing when, when at times we feel that we've come so far and then something happens in the world and we think, my gosh, how can that possibly happen in today's day and age? Of all the social movements, you know, the anti-Vietnam protest movements, the women's movement, the uh, First Nations or Native American movements, um, the gay rights movements, you name it. Uh, really, I would argue that in terms of uh, the 20th century, that it's really the American Civil Rights Movement that, that gets much of the ball rolling. Now, of course, there were other civil rights movements, certainly when you look at Mahatma Gandhi, whose movement really begins sort of uh, when he uh, goes to South Africa in the very, very uh, late part of the 19th century. Um, and there's many examples like that where within the network of colonialism we see a movement, Ho Chi Minh in, in, in Indochina, same kind of thing. Um, but in the United States there had always been this perplexing scenario where um, slavery had been abolished way back, I believe, in 1861 with uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, Emancipation Proclamation. And, you know, one of the common questions my students ask me is, why is it that if the slaves in the United States were freed way back in 1861, why were they still fighting for civil rights a hundred years later? And that's a very good question and a very valid question. And basically what I say is that although the slaves were freed, the economic relationships between landlord or landowner and slave had changed very little. And, and, and we're going to talk about that as we go through this presentation, that freedom is a wonderful thing if you are in a position to take advantage of it. Um, whether it be that you have a good education, you have a great skill, you have money, whatever it may be, that but for those that are being discriminated against or being marginalized in society for whatever reason, yes, on paper, they are as free as anybody else. But um, some people are maybe more free than others, which sounds kind of ironic. And I believe uh, that is a quote taken from uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. Isn't there something in there? But anyway. So, much to talk about. I'm starting in 1945, and I'm, by no means am I suggesting that's when it starts. Uh, but it's when those soldiers return after World War II, um, obviously, and particularly the African-American troops, 
that we see a significant shift in thinking and, uh, and, and we'll explain that as well as we go through this. So, so you know, if you're interested in American history, um, I would strongly suggest that you uh, look into the causes of the Civil War. The study of the Civil War is an amazing part of American history. Um, but a very tragic and brutal one as well. Just as a footnote in where the American Civil War is concerned, uh, that more Americans died in the American Civil War than, than the combined fatalities of every war that they have fought since. So example, all the deaths in the Spanish-American War of 1898, in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, all those American deaths combined do not equal to the amount of Americans that died in the American Civil War, brother against brother, right? Civil wars are the most heart-wrenching because at the end of the Civil War you're left to clean up the pieces and work together or try to work together as a nation again to rebuild. So, so and the details of the causes of that war is a whole other <laughs> series of lectures. Um, you know, we know it's about the slavery issue, but if you ask a Southerner what the Civil War was about, many, if not most, would say it was about states' rights. That is, the right of a state to determine its own destiny. So, for example, when Abraham Lincoln abolishes slavery, maybe some Southern states didn't want that to happen because they felt that slavery was embedded in their economy, which it was. Um, but, um, you know, um, they felt that it was not, it, it, it was within their right as a state to make their own determination as to how they wish to proceed in issues like slavery. But anyway, the Emancipation Proclamation came in and Abraham Lincoln in, wanted to enforce that uh, change. And that is one of the primary causes, of course, of the American Civil War. But in addition to that, there was a relatively significant cultural divide between the South and the North. And I don't want to oversimplify this, particularly for my American viewers that have a much, maybe better, more in-depth understanding of the complex dynamic and relationship between these two regions. But in a very straightforward sense, the South was more agrarian. The South was more steeped in, in sort of a, a, a Puritan, uh, uh, Protestant, Baptist ethos. The, the, the South had a completely different climate. And the South, their economy was very much integrated at that time with slavery. In the North, we see bigger cities, greater economic development, the head of government, the head of banking, the growth of big cities, and generally more open-minded liberal thinking in the North than in the South. So in that very general sense, there is a difference. The South had always identified itself as, a, as separate from the North, northern part of the country, maybe less so today, although there is a certain degree of Southern nationalism, of course, that, that kind of crops up every now and again, particularly when they start uh, removing statues of uh, Civil War generals, uh, which we've seen um, in Charlottesville and other places lately. Um, but there is definitely a different type of thinking, a different, a different uh, a viewpoint of, of their own history, different interpretations of history, and different value systems. One isn't better than the other, they're just two sort of solitudes right next to each other. The Civil War of 1862 to 65 was an issue over slavery, but as I mentioned before, also a reaction and clash between Southern tradition and Northern progress. Um, what I mean by progress is moving forward. Tradition, conservatism, the desire for things to stay the same, the, the discomfort with moving forward. If, if you're comfortable where you're at, and you are guided by certain principles, you don't want things to change, right? In this case, that's what I mean by progress, the willingness to, to, to move forward, to change, um, to accommodate the changing culture of world geopolitics and, 
and the United States' relationship with other nations of the world. So, so there really is a bit of a divide between those two regions. Southerners see their culture as unique, and I, I completely appreciate that, and sacred, and it's kind of steeped, as I said earlier, in that Southern Baptist tradition and conservative values. So, um, you know, uh, two very, very different kind of worlds. And you can imagine that from a Southern perspective, that when the North, the head of government, makes decisions that has a dramatic impact on their economy, there is going to be a reaction, and there certainly was in 1862. So, segregation uh, continues um, with the passing of the Jim Crow laws in 1896. Segregated restaurants, businesses, schools, etc. Okay, before we talk about Jim Crow, I wanted to briefly talk about how things looked at the end of the American Civil War. Now, coming back to that idea of what, what freedom means and what opportunities are available to you in a free society. When the slaves were freed, many of them, obviously, because of their condition and their history, did not have an education, were not literate did not have any skills beyond what they did on, uh, on the farms in which they worked, um, usually the cotton farms in the Deep South. And when, that when they were officially free, you know, sure, they could go wherever they wanted. They're free to go where they want. But maybe none of them, maybe a lot of them didn't have anywhere to go. Maybe some of them were afraid to go anywhere. And a lot of them would go back to their their lords, their landlords, or their, or their, or their, um, you know, the, the farm owners, and say, look, you know, I, I, I get the fact that I'm free, and but you know what, I've got nowhere to go. Uh, can I just stick around here, keep doing what I'm doing? And the farm owner might say, well, sure, you can stick around. I'll pay you 50 bucks a month, and then uh, room and board is 50 bucks. How about we call it a day? Great. There were incidents where some landlords or or or, or or um, landowners were had better relationships with their slaves than others. They, you know, they weren't all brutal tyrants. Many of them were, but you know that that varied obviously from farm to farm. So for many of the African Americans, it's fair to say that while they were free on paper, the economic relationship that they had in their position of where they worked on the farms uh, didn't change. That, and that's why we see a hundred years later this fairly significant paradigm shift. Now the Jim Crow laws, basically the, the ideas of Jim Crow had been institutionalized right after at the end of the Civil War, but the, the Jim Crow laws in, in uh, the segregated South basically institutionalized the idea of race, of race relations between African Americans and white Americans, you know, segregated restaurants, businesses, schools, etc. And those are the very conditions, of course, that the civil rights uh, leaders were pressing against segregation. All right, well, by the early 20th century, little has changed in the South, but the North has become increasingly industrialized, modern, and liberal. So you know, you get kind of almost like this sort of people living in a bubble in the South. I mean, you know, maybe they weren't interested in what was happening in the North. Maybe they didn't want anything to do with the North. They wanted to just retreat into their life, do what they did, feel like they are um, living the life that they want a life regardless of what is happening up in the North, right? So, so there was this sort of uneasy tension that existed between the American South and the American North. African American soldiers in both wars were treated with dignity and respect by the French and British and brought to light inequalities at home. Okay, so if you grow up in a society where you have been discriminated against and your mother and father and grandparents all have suffered discrimination, you don't know any better. Now you know that it doesn't feel right when someone says you know, something lousy to you or calls you names or, or hurts you physically, that never feels good. But unless you know what it's like to be treated well, then being treated like a slave or being treated 
poorly is simply the reality in which you live. Now what's very interesting is, and this is very prevalent in, in the first and both wars, Second World War, when the troops, the American troops get to Europe, and let's use World War II as, as the second of the two examples. You know, after D-Day, after the liberation of Paris uh, by the summer of 1944, and as the Americans, Canadians, and British, and others move towards Germany, um, if you were living in Nazi-occupied France, and you were liberated by American troops, and you'd suffered four years of a brutal occupation, do you think you're going to give a hoot what color the skin is of the soldier is that, that, that um, liberated you? No. Because when those troops came in, they were... It didn't, the French didn't care if you were African American. They hugged you, they kissed you, they welcomed you in your home, they fed you, they thanked you. And what's interesting is that many, many Amer African American troops, and even the army was segregated. There was discrimination even in the ranks of the darn army. So, I mean, there was no escape from it. But what's interesting is that when those African American troops are treated like this, they're like, wow, boy, does that ever feel good to be treated with respect and dignity? What a wonderful thing. So they have now experienced what it's like to be treated well. So when they all go back home after the war, although some marry French women and stay in France, which is interesting, and you can't necessarily blame them, especially if they're from somewhere like Bermuda, Alabama, where things are really, really difficult down there. Um, when those American troops, African American troops, go back home, the discrimination they experience again is almost more... Um, noticeable because they've now got the reference point of being treated well. So it's a very interesting idea. Urbanization also revealed the ugliness of segregation. The more that societies become connected, whether it be through uh, better highway systems, better train systems, through film, through phone, through movies, through later television, of course, becomes a great friend of the civil rights movement later and I'll explain why. Uh, the more urban and the more modern societies become, particularly all of the United States, the more it is really hard to kind of hide how truly ugly segregation is, I guess is the best way to put it. And in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education decision struck down the separate but equal doctrine declaring segregation of public schools as unconstitutional. Brown versus Board of Education is the first domino. Um, because basically what it says is just that, that the segregation of public schools is unconstitutional. You can't have inferior schools <clears throat> with inferior desks and old crummy notebooks and not the proper uh, pens and pencils and supplies needed, yet the white schools have everything new, shiny, so on and so forth. So it was very, very clear that segregation in in education was limiting the opportunities of African Americans who were getting a far inferior education. So therefore, no more segregation. Well, holy mackerel, the, the, the kickback from this is pretty quick and pretty, uh, pretty harsh right off the bat. So, and I think probably the first big example uh, would be in Little Rock, Arkansas. And integration, of course, was met with bitter resistance in some states, Arkansas being one of them. In Little Rock, Governor Faubus ordered in state troops to prevent black students from entering the public school in 1957. Okay, he, he brings in the state troops, Arkansas troops, to halt the entrance of African Americans into the schools after the federal government had declared it unconstitutional. So they're going rogue. We don't care what you say up in the north. This is our state. States' rights. Remember, we talked about that at the beginning. Um, and these state troops were brought in. And here they are. Well, no, this is later the federal troops that, that escort them. This is a very, very famous picture. You know, she, I can't remember her name, but she was one of the first to dare to try to enter the school, which was her constitutional right to do so. This woman in the back, and look at the faces of these women, absolute just anger and hatred and bitterness. 
Several years after this picture that was taken, this image became so iconic that this woman here made a public apology for her actions in Little Rock. I think maybe because her face became an uh, iconic image of hatred and bigotry, she obviously felt some shame and disgust by being the poster child for this kind of thing. And later she came to a, a, had an epiphany and, and so on and so forth. But anyway, back in 57, <coughs> Eisenhower, the president at the time, was irate at Fowlers and said, you have no right to deny these students the right to an education. So he rolls in the federal troops. And at one point, Arkansas state troops and federal troops were going, were staring each other down toe to toe. And eventually those African Americans would then be escorted by state troops into the schools. Troops would stay for six weeks, the federal troops that is, and then they would eventually leave. Um, but look at this. Governor Faubus, the uh, Arkansas governor, his, his actions gained him popularity and he was re-elected to six terms. This is important because what does this say about attitudes in Arkansas? It suggests that they very clearly supported the idea of segregation. And of course, Arkansas was not alone. Uh, you've got Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and other places where we have the same type of situation. Well, it's in Montgomery, Rosa Parks. Uh, African Americans were expected to sit at the back of the bus. You know, what an interesting idea. You get on the bus, it doesn't matter if there's a whole bunch of seats up front, you got to go to the back. And if you're sitting down even in the back and there's no seats available, you always have to give up your seat to a white man, period, or white woman. If they enter, you are expected to get up and stand. So, Rosa Parks sat up front, which she wasn't supposed to do, um, and she refused to give up her seat to a white man. She was arrested, and the African Americans in Montgomery staged a boycott until the bus company came in. This was a brilliant, brilliant move. Because the African Americans had the power of the state, the power of the police forces, you know, against them. You know, it, it was very, very difficult for them to put up a fight against institutionalized discrimination and segregation. So because such a high percentage of people that rode the bus in Montgomery were African American, they agreed that they would simply not ride the bus. And of course, it didn't take long before the bus company began to go broke. At which time they caved and said, okay, fine, you can sit wherever you want. So this act of civil disobedience was one of the first nonviolent civil disobedience that um, put so much pressure on the bus company that they actually succumbed. So it's interesting. This campaign would be led by a 26-year-old Baptist minister, Martin Luther King Jr., who already had his um, a master's and I believe a doctorate in theology, I think it was. So 26 years old to be that highly educated is pretty remarkable. Now what's interesting about Martin Luther King, and this should be clarified, that when all this stuff went down in Montgomery, he was kind of the passionate, engaging, charismatic Baptist minister in the, in the church in Montgomery. And he was asked by members of the African American community to, hey, listen, we're onto something here with this boycott. We need to keep kind of keep keep the pressure going. And King initially said, look, you know what? I, my wife is here. I've, I can't remember if he'd had a child yet or his wife was close to having a child. But either way, um, he basically said, ah, you know what? I got a good thing right now. I don't want to mess with it. Thanks, but no thanks. And it actually took quite a bit of pressure. Uh, in the, from the community to say, we need you, we need leadership in this movement, we need to gain momentum. We can't just let the Montgomery bus boycott be it, or it'll be forgotten about. We need to capitalize on this. Because people read about it across the states, and there was a relatively clear understanding that we needed to keep the pressure. All right. Well, there he was, born in Georgia in 1929. He would preach nonviolence and passive resistance following the ideas of Gandhi. Gandhi, of course, um, what a remarkable life he had. We'll come back and we'll look at uh, Gandhi in India in another lecture. Um, 
but he was very much inspired by India uh, and Gandhi because he had managed to kind of bring the British Empire to its knees uh, through a campaign of, of non-violence, non-violent civil disobedience. They can hit you, but don't hit back. And what Gandhi used to say is that, you know what, take the blow to the head, it's going to hurt, but eventually the British Empire will feel guilty about their, what they're doing and they will leave. Boy, that's a tough thing to convince people of. Uh, you know, the United States was considerably more violent, though there's quite a bit more brutal violence, and it certainly was violent in India too. The British authorities were not not too happy with uh, Gandhi's campaign, but in the United States there seemed to be um, a greater tendency to, to, to enact brutal violence very, very quickly. So there was a real cauldron of anger bubbling in these American states. Uh, similar campaigns would occur throughout the segregated South. So after Montgomery, he kind of becomes the reluctant leader of a general movement. Now keep in mind the Civil Rights Movement is not just one group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was his organization. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but there was the NAACP, there were the Communist Party, there were so many, it was a broad coalition of groups on the left and the right and everywhere in between. Uh, so the Civil Rights Movement was really a very broad sort of popular front movement encompassed uh, by several different organizations. The Freedom Riders toured southern cities to defy segregation in public facilities. The Freedom Riders were very, very brave. I mean, basically what it was is that we begin to see a lot of young liberal white kids, not only in the south but in the north, saying, you know what, we gotta, we gotta do something about this. this, this Racism business is immoral, we don't like segregation, we need to support integration, we need to support equality. And what would happen was African Americans and sympathetic white, young, usually white students, would get on a bus somewhere in the north where the bus station was not segregated. And so they would, let's say, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they would take a, a, a bus to a station that was segregated. Birmingham, Alabama. And of course, when these buses finally arrived, you know, there would be like the police with their billy clubs and, 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 and hateful gangs out there ready to just stone them to death when they came off and beat them off. And, and there was brutality in these bus depots. And, uh, but just the, the bravery of these young kids, both African American and white American, willing to put their literally their lives on the line to kind of make a point. So the Freedom Riders were, were very brave. These protests provoked brutal attacks by southern racist gangs and state police. And the violence witnessed by Americans on TV outraged most and forced John F. Kennedy to step in with the National Guard. John F. Kennedy, of course, becomes president in 1960. So this is where television is very, very important. Because if you lived in Spokane, Washington, or Duluth, Minnesota, or Irisburg, Vermont, completely as far away from the American South as you can get. It's one thing to read about these events, but when you turn on the TV and see police, state police beating up on African Americans, fire hosing them, billy clubbing them, sending German shepherds on them, that's going to have a tremendous impact on you. And in many ways, television, much like the anti-Vietnam protest movements, really push people, um, uh, you know, to support the cause of equality. They, the people were, were just dumbstruck by what they were seeing uh, throughout the United States. So, okay, in April 63, King organized a march on Birmingham where public areas were still segregated. You know, what Martin Luther King begins to do is he says, we need to shine a spotlight on every part of this country that continues to stick to their hateful, segregated systems. And, you know, even though, you know, some areas were, were more segregated than others, um, eventually the goal is to just get rid of this whole archaic system built around racism.
But he said, we're going to go to the most racist parts of this country because he knew the media was going to follow and he knew that they were going to be filming and that Americans would then be watching. King wanted to show the ugliness of, uh, and Birmingham obliged with dogs and fire hoses on innocent protesters. Here we go here. You know, young kids who just don't know better. You know, we won't go to school with Negroes. A strike against integration. I mean, it's it's really, really quite remarkable that these values were so prevalent. And uh, you know, JFK intervened, and Birmingham was desegregated. You know, but but it's all fine and good. You know, to to make laws, but how's that going to change? people's behavior. Martin Luther King had many remarkable quotations. One of my favorites is that he once said something to the effect of judicial decrees can't change the heart but they will restrain the heartless. Okay, one more time. Just think about this for a second. Judicial decrees, laws, can't change the heart but they can restrain the heartless. So what's he saying? He's saying basically you can put in laws to prevent people from doing bad things but you can't change the way they feel. And King was keenly aware of that. That this was, desegregation was just the beginning of the fight because that's the point at which that these southern states really got angry. How dare you overturn our state policies and, 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 and make us do something we don't want to do. So that's what really brings out the dark and ugly, right? So just the beginning. Uh, Martin Luther King referred to this city as the most segregated and hate-driven state in the Union. So once again, hitting the places in the Union that are going to demonstrate uh, the ugliness of segregation. And certainly... Uh, Birmingham obliged. Well, in most liberal, white, open-minded parts of the country, he is gaining a tremendous amount of notoriety. And I would say that the March on Washington in 1963 is kind of like, it's the height of his success because things begin to kind of tip the other way uh, after. 200,000 African Americans and 50,000 supporters marched to the federal capital. Um, the aim was to pressure JFK to enact a civil rights bill. That's what this was all about. We're going to send all these people into Washington and we're going to say, we need you to do this. There was no incidents and not even any litter. Think about that for a second. 250,000 people convene on a location and when they leave there's no litter. Why is that important? Well, think about it. They wanted to leave a mark by not leaving anything, by saying, this is how we, we are going to clean up after ourselves. We are going to show that a quarter of a million people can come together and leave the location exactly the way that it was when we entered it. So it actually does say quite a powerful thing. Of course, King makes his I Have a Dream speech. And, um, you know, one of the great speeches, nothing complicated, but very, very powerful. It was actually, I believe, his secretary who gave him the idea. He said that, oh, my daughter was telling me, oh, mommy, I, have a, I had a dream last night or something. And, and uh, she said that to Martin Luther King, and he went, I have, I have a dream. I have it. I like that. So he, he, had, he had the bug put in his ear. He did write the I Have a Dream speech, but, but he, he had it, I think, he got the inspiration from his secretary. So uh, This event had tremendous impact on American public opinion. You know, I mean, that's what I mean by the pinnacle. Now, of course, the, 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 the attitudes towards the civil rights movement didn't decline dramatically, but, but this, to me, is like the climax, if you will, of the, of the, of the civil rights movement, is the, is the March on Washington. July 26th, uh, now of course Kennedy had been assassinated the previous November, uh, November 22nd, I believe, 1963. Lyndon Johnson, of course, is thrown into the, uh, the job. And what we know about Johnson in, in comparison to, to Kennedy, at least where civil rights is concerned, that he had a, a real authentic um, attitude and feelings about civil rights. I mean, 
you know, when he becomes president, he puts in his Great Society, which is kind of his version of the New Deal. He wanted to eradicate poverty, eradicate bigotry and hatred. Like, I think he quite authentically wanted to make America a better place for all Americans. And, and I would never take that away from Johnson. The irony with Johnson, of course, is that while he was very, very liberal and progressive when it came to race relations and, and, and economic equality and so forth, he was very much very hawkish when it came to uh, the acceleration of America in Vietnam. So it's a kind of a bit of an interesting dichotomy between those two things. Um, he signs the Civil Rights Act and Freedom Summer follows. It becomes illegal for local governments to discriminate in areas such as housing, employment, and education. Okay, so Johnson's going one step further. Now the problem with this is that you can't necessarily micromanage how to ensure this. So for example, you are, a, you are renting a, an apartment and five people apply. Four of them are African American and one is white. And the four African Americans even might have better jobs or, have, or on a good pay scale or whatever it may be. Um, you, you know, in many cases the, the one white guy is going to get the rent, right? So it's very difficult. Um, employment, the same thing, right? <laughs> um, education may be a little harder to conceal that kind of discrimination. But certainly in housing and employment, you know, you got to change attitudes, right? Judicial decrees can't change the heart, but they can restrain the heartless. You know, you flip that around and you say, okay, well, we've got laws in to stop bad behavior. Now we have to wait for people to, 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 to lose those archaic, ugly attitudes about discrimination and race. And that is going to take a generation or two. King's campaign, uh, King campaigned rather to African Americans, AA African Americans, to register to vote and was helped from thousands of whites from the North. And in 20 months following the Civil Rights Act, 430,000 black Americans registered. That is remarkable. You know, and one of the tragedies is, is that in some places, African American registrations were so low, despite the Civil Rights Act, because African Americans were afraid that when they went to vote, they would get beaten up. And in many cases, that's what happens, right? So, I mean, once again, you're getting the institutionalized changes in laws, but you still have to wait for values and attitudes to change as well. King targeted areas where racism was worst, and in Selma, Alabama, he organized a march where only 2.4% of African Americans were registered to vote. 2.4. The march without King was brutally attacked by authorities, um, and it's all caught on film. You know, the media was there, and watching African Americans be billy clubbed, and all they were doing was marching for African Americans to get out and vote. LBJ pushed through the Voting Rights Bill in 1965, and this act allowed governments to inspect voting procedures to ensure a proper process. So, you know, Johnson is clearly trying to, to, to make the right changes and accommodate all the ugly scenarios that, that, that many of these, uh, these uh, hateful groups were trying to undermine. So. Selma. And you know, King got a little bit of heat about Selma because he didn't go. He made a comment to someone to the effect of, well, I'm not going to go and, you know, I'm not going to walk in front of the firing squad or something like that. And I guess he got a bit skewered for that. It was the wrong thing to say. But uh, I mean, King by 65, you know, you watch him when a firecracker goes off, he, he jumps, you know, and, and, and he, death threats were, were coming in and, uh, you know, the poor guy, you know, he, he knew, he knew that the writing was on the wall, that it was only a matter of time. And what a horrible way to live your life in constant fear that someone is going to assassinate you. And, you know, April 4th, 1968, that does eventually happen. So. Uh, now, many urban African Americans felt King's methods were soft and violence was justified. Okay, so not all African Americans thought that nonviolent civil disobedience was the way to go. 
in the inner cities, in places like Watts or in Oakland, California, which was, I believe, the birthplace of the Black Panthers, in, uh, you know, in urban um, Detroit, like Chicago, you know, there was a real militant element growing, understandably, who has said, you know what, you don't want to integrate with us and we don't want to integrate with you, you know, like Malcolm X, one of the most uh, prolific of the uh, civil rights leaders who starts out very, very militant. Now, Malcolm X, remarkable history, you should read, um, oh gosh, what's the biography by Haley, the author of the, of the book's uh, roots, um, Alex Haley, I believe his name was, um, great book on, uh, on, um, on Malcolm X. You know, he had a troubled youth in Boston, was imprisoned, he was self-educated in prison, very, he became very well read, and he was converted to Islam. A lot of African Americans convert to Islam because they see Christianity as kind of the white man's religion, understandably, and they don't want anything to do with the white man's religion. And, uh, you know, so many joined, uh, you know, the leader, Elijah Muhammad at the time, and, and his organization of, of African American Muslims. And of course, Cassius Clay would become a Muslim, he'd become Muhammad Ali. And um, so many African Americans felt King's methods were soft, so they, their thinking was, well, if they're going to use a gun against me, I'll use a gun against them. If they're going to hit me with a billy club, I'm going to hit them back with one too. You know, it's, it's a knee-jerk reaction. I mean, I think Mark, you know, uh, Malcolm X, uh, whose, by the way, his birth name, I believe, was Malcolm Little, and he removed the Little because it was a slave name. Um, had sort of come to the conclusion, apologies for the phone, <laughs> um, had come to the conclusion that, um, you know, that, that we need to make some, some serious changes here and that uh, the problem with, with violence is that unfortunately if you are violent against um, someone, they're going to be violent against you and then this just vicious circle goes. And you know, Malcolm X once quoted that, you know, be courteous, uh, obey the law, you know, love your family, but a man, if a man puts his hand up against you or raises his arm against you, put him in his grave. You know, he said these kinds of things that were very, very powerful. And, um, and uh, you know, he was very good looking, very handsome man, very charismatic, very well dressed, and very calm and spoke with tremendous authority. And I think in many ways, um, you know, uh, almost more of an effective speaker than King himself, uh, just by his mere presence. But uh, he wasn't much of a fan of, of um, Martin Luther King. Um, I mean, I think there was probably some mutual respect, but, you know, they're coming from two very different places. The Nation of Islam, headed by Elijah Muhammad, drew in many African Americans. Malcolm X would rise in this organization, and boxer Cassius Clay would join. Um, and what's very interesting about Malcolm X is that, uh, like a good Muslim, he went on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And when he goes to Mecca, he sees white Muslims, Arabic Muslims, African Muslims, um, multicolors. And it's in Mecca where he has a bit of an epiphany. Now, wait a second here. This is not about race, right? And it, it changes him. It changes him, and he comes back. And a lot of his aggressive, militant rhetoric kind of subsides, you know. And, and as he's rising in the, in the nation of Islam, um, he's, interestingly enough, assassinated. And many believe that um, elements of the nation of Islam were behind it themselves. We don't know to what extent Elijah Muhammad was behind it. I, I haven't read anything recently, but... You know, um, people didn't. People felt threatened by his popularity within the movement. So uh, he suffers the same fate as King, but only three years prior. These groups wanted to create an African American state in the USA. You know, uh, okay, if you don't want to be, we don't want to integrate with you either. Just give us a chunk of the states and let us all go there. We'll have our own country, and then you can do your thing. We'll do ours. Well, that's. Not realistic. I mean, it's a great idea, but uh, it was going to be very difficult to justify quarantining officer or coordinating uh, a section of the United States to become a different nation. 
The Black Panthers believe they should arm themselves to force equal rights. Here they are there, you know, uh, could be very daunting bumping into these guys, you know, on the streets of Oakland if you're walking alone. Although they didn't go and harm people, they looked very foreboding, but really for them it was, you know, this is about getting equal rights. All right, in major urban centers like LA, particularly in the Watts District in Detroit, uh, race riots broke out. Um, police forces were generally white and most poor were African Americans. Deadly combination. Most cities were segregated into white and black sections. Um, and many rioters were influenced by the radical black nationalists. I mean, you know, once again, you had black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. And, you know, white families don't want to move into black neighborhoods and black families don't necessarily want to move into white neighborhoods, right? It's going to have to be something that you can't enforce. It's going to have to happen gradually. And that's why busing was such a problem, because you're busing, you know, African-American kids into other neighborhoods in white schools, and, you know, you're, you're forcing integration. And while it was well-intentioned, the busing phenomenon really kind of backfired later, so... All right, April 4th, 1968, MLK is assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. And these two pictures are quite remarkable because they are taken from two different perspectives, but merely seconds apart. Here is very, very soon, like moments before he's assassinated. And the picture below is from a different perspective on the side of moments just after he's been shot. And there he is lying down. And these guys here... Uh, Jesse James, or I mean, uh, yeah, what was his name again? Yeah, uh, oh gosh, can't remember all the names of these guys, but um, they're all pointing. He's over there, he's over there. It was never proven who hired the assassin. Wasn't it James Earl Ray, I think? Um, named the guy who did it. His death marked the end of an era. MLK helped transform the movement from a southern sideshow to a national movement. And as a result, segregation was now illegal. The Civil Rights Act had enshrined African American rights into law, and African Americans now held real political power in the South. Now, I do not want to suggest that the Civil Rights Movement ends with the death of Martin Luther King. But with the death of Martin Luther King, you have a significant central voice extinguished. Um, if you watch his speech that he made the night before, you know, um, the mountaintop speech, I may not get there with you, and the promised land, that, that speech is truly chilling because he basically says that, you know what, I'm going to do everything I can to get you to the mountaintop and into the kingdom of heaven, and I probably won't get there with you, um, you know, and then the next day he's assassinated. One thing I would strongly recommend is watching Robert Kennedy's um, speech. I can't remember where he was at the time, but it's a film of him, I think on the day of the assassination, where he's making a speech in front of a group of African Americans, and he tells them. They don't know yet, and he says, I have some terrible news, and then he makes a speech, and you hear gasping and crying, and and it's just such a poignant moment um, uh, from Robert Kennedy, who, not long after King, just a couple of months after Martin Luther King, he himself is assassinated as well. So, all right, well, there you go, just sort of a an overview. Like I say, many of these subtopics could be uh, certainly investigated. Um, uh, deeper. I just hope that I've given you enough to kind of give you an idea of the big picture and if there's components of it that you wish to do further study for I would strongly recommend it. It's a remarkable period of history and, uh, uh, and as I said earlier to note that the civil rights movement does not end, it continues and of course we are still going through a period of civil rights and I think it's going to be going on for a long time. So. That being said, I want to thank you again for coming to my lectures, and uh, we look forward to see you uh, next time. Cheers.